days long past in warfare when the man on a horse could direct a battle from the top of a hill by sending out runners with orders to this or that section of the line. Modern fluid warfare knows no well-defined line. The front can be all around us in the swirl of a modern battle. are the nerves of an army. And an army without them is a blind giant stumbling around in the dark. The Signal Corps is responsible for army communication. And because of the demands of modern battle, is an arm as well as a service. The Signal Corps fights. A line goes out to an artillery observation post. Enemy patrols like to find these lines when they do, these lines have to be repaired, quick. They also like to wait for us to come out to do it. When this happens, nobody wants the other side to spot them by the sound of firing. Knives are best. The advance of the Russian armies across immense spaces could not have been carried out without communication. lightning sweep through France could never have been accomplished without the closest coordination. That means communication. We found that a great contributing factor to the German disaster in France was that their communications had broken down bombed out, shelled out, or overrun by swiftly advancing ground troops. Everywhere, the master race retreated. Our work being highly specialized demands specially trained personnel. These men training at the school in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, are already officers. They have already learned how to handle men. Here, they learn how to do a difficult job on top of they're going to command men like these in the enlisted men's schools who, beside being soldiers, are trained technicians. One of the variety of things these officers are learning to use is radio relay, a recent development. Field wire has its limits for possible use. We could spend a lot of time trying to put wire communications across this kind of terrain and then fail. Here's where radio relay comes in. At the point where the wire can't go forward any further, this sending station is set up. At the next point from which wire can start again, a receiver is set up. And over whatever obstacle is holding us up, communications proceed. And not only messages. The photograph of a much needed map through the use of facsimile can be flashed from sender to receiver. Radio relay is only one of the many new means of communications developed and used by us, or developed by us, and furnished to other arms, which brings us to one of our very important functions. We procure and distribute over 5,000 different items of signal communications equipment to all the other arms and services of our ground forces and air forces. Navy gets a lot of it, and of course, our allies. We have developed and made changes in many types of signal equipment, reducing the size and weight while increasing the efficiency. Here are two old type tubes. Here their modern counterparts. The advantages are obvious. In the fiscal year of 1943, our appropriation from the War Department was $4,927,000,000. In 1944, $5,546,000,000. A better than $5 billion a year business. Big in any league. All this we pack, ship, and send on its way. Part of the never-ending gray shuttle that goes back and forth across the world seas, 
carrying to our armies and our allied armies the things it takes to win the war. These days, this gray shuttle moves in security. But that security is recent. It's not long ago, the Nazi wolf packs were roving the seas in large numbers. Our shipping situation was more than critical. It wasn't only valuable ships and crews we were losing, it was invaluable cargo. The wolf packs have been destroyed or driven to their lairs, from which they don't dare to emerge. Even these little jobs were detected and put out of business. A land-based bomber is on a routine flight. Its job, protection of the seaways. He locates a sub by radar. Two miles, dead ahead. Steady, one and a half, one mile. Steady. We pioneered and developed the radar used by the Air Forces in their sea hunt. Before we follow these safely sailing cargoes to their destination and final use, let's find out something about their origin. In laboratories all over the country, we employ some of the finest engineering brains in the world, both military and civilian, in peacetime as well as wartime. Things like radar, radio relay, new developments in television, such as controlling the flight of a bomb onto its target through cloud masses. We developed and furnished to the engineers these mine detectors. There's no type of mine, metallic or not, which can't now be located. The enemies tried wooden boxes, even tried glass containers that looked like pie plates. But we can find them all. We developed and furnished to the artillery these microphones, which, when buried in advanced zones, send back information on enemy artillery. There's a new kind of radar we developed and gave to the air forces. This plane is lost, as it happens, is lost on a training flight in this country. But what you will see can happen and has happened in combat. They're looking for Boston. The pilot switches on his radar. This, the only piece of film of its kind in existence, is what he sees on his scope as the radar waves pierce the thick cloud layer and reflect back from the surface of the Earth. The radar-trained man, looking at it, can read it as clearly as you can read this map. He knows that black spot is Boston Harbor, and that he's directly over it. And that's how our bombers are finding their targets through the blackness of night or any kind of weather. That's how our bombers knew they were over the Channel Coast in the darkness before dawn on D-Day. Speaking of weather, the long-range forecasts made possible in this war are attributable to different types of meteorological equipment developed by us, now used by both ground and air forces. The clues to what the weather will be like next week are today thousands of miles away. But for the planning of any large-scale operations, what the weather will be like next week must be known today. An attack or invasion is being planned, both for air and ground, we must know what atmospheric conditions far behind enemy lines will be for the next few days. So an automatic weather station is dropped by parachute. This is a new development, the SCM-18. It works on a principle called radio sun. The station's timing mechanism is so set that within a few minutes of landing, it will send out the first weather observation. From then on, every three hours for a week or more, it will continue to send out weather data in code. Pressure, temperature, humidity, and station identification will be transmitted eight times for a period of one minute. 
As yet, it hasn't learned to cook. 